All right. So uh, let's just go ahead and get started with prayer. Uh, our Father, we thank you for um, knowing us, loving us, uh, giving us your word so that we might know you. Thank you for saving us and for sending us into the world and te to tell everyone about uh, what you've done for us. Uh, we ask that you'd give us the grace tonight to just be humbled and transformed by your holy word through your Holy Spirit. Amen. So, first, there was a, a man who lived in India from 1889 to 1929. He became known as the Apostle of the Bleeding Feet. His name is Sadhu Sundar Singh. He was converted in a very similar fashion as that of the Apostle Saul, or Paul. He's the main character of our message tonight. I'll refer to him as Saul, but he is also the Apostle Paul. This is just his name before it was changed. So, Sadhu, he was a, a vehemently against Christianity in the same way that Saul was. Until one night, he had a vision of Jesus Christ, and it transformed his entire life. When his family members realized that this, just, this wasn't just some fleeting phase of his life, they poisoned him and sent him away. He landed on the front doorstep of a pastor, and the pastor brought the Christian pastor brought him into his house, called a doctor, and when the doctor got there, he saw him for a little bit, but then pretty much right away realized that he was not going to recover and that Sadhu would soon just die. And as he laid there, about to die very soon, he suddenly was struck with the belief that God had not called him out of darkness just to die. He suddenly was struck with the belief that God called him out of darkness for a purpose, and that the reason that God called him out of darkness was to bear witness about Jesus. When that struck him, Sadhu decided to take the rest of his strength and pray to God and ask for God to heal him, that he would recover, and he did. He, st he, he started to recover over a number of days and weeks, and then once he was finally back on his feet, he launched into an entire life of witnessing about what Jesus has do had done, that Jesus saved him. He would travel the length and the breadth of all of India to tell people the gospel from that day until the very end of his life. He couldn't really afford shoes, and so he would just walk around often barefoot. And this is how he got the name, or the title, the Apostle of the Bleeding Feet. As he grew older and he was about to die, Sadhu's realization was, at, on his deathbed, essentially, was that he really was saved to tell others the gospel. It just struck him. I really was saved by God to tell others the gospel, because that's, that's what he did. And it's, it's my hope that tonight, each and every one of us would walk away with the same realization that we have been saved to tell others the gospel. And that's why I've entitled the message, Saved and Sent. And we're going to look at this under three headings. Saul's commission, Saul's circumstance, and how to apply this text. First, Saul's commission. Saul's commission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. If you remember back to last week where we looked at Saul on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by a light and God spoke to him. Saul was converted and then led to a stranger's house in Damascus. The Lord then said, this about Saul, this is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then we pick up this week in Acts chapter 9, verse 19, if you want to flip open your Bible. It says, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. 
He is the Son of God. Saul immediately began to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. What does that actually mean when you say Jesus is the Son of God? What would the audience have been hearing when Saul was proclaiming to them, Jesus is the Son of God? What would they have been understanding? Well, Jesus being the Son of God is two things, at least. It's two things. It's both a title of Jesus and it's a trait. First, the Son of God as a title. The title Son of God was used in the Old Testament to primarily refer to three things. The people of Israel, the anointed king of Israel, and the future king of Israel that God promised would come from the line of David and save the people of Israel. When Saul proclaims Jesus as the Son of God, what he's declaring to the people of Israel is this. He's saying that the man that you just crucified is God's promised and anointed king and savior over Israel. That's what they would have been hearing. It was an extremely offensive claim. But like I said, it's not just a title. The Son of God is also a trait. It's a character trait. What it indicates is that there's something unique about Jesus. So when we say Jesus is the Son of God, it's about his character trait, his uniqueness, what sets him apart from each and every one of us. Why is he different than us? It's because he is the Son of God. He has a character trait that's different. It speaks of his relationship with God the Father, a type of relationship with God the Father that none of us have. It's a type of fellowship that Jesus has that none of us have. He is truly the one and only Son of God. And Jesus, being the one and only true Son of God, He is, he is, only, he is God's only true Son of God for so many reasons. But we're going to look at two. First, according to God's perfect design for human life, a, son's, a son would perfectly obey their father. According to God's perfect design, a son would perfectly obey their father. The father would have complete authority over their son's life. And only in Jesus is this the case. Only in Jesus' life did God our Father have perfect authority over his child. The reason we know that God had perfect authority over Jesus is because Jesus perfectly obeyed God. Something that none of us have done. Just by show of hands, who here has perfectly obeyed God? In every thought, word, and deed. All right. And so what that means is that you need Jesus. That's the point. You, you need Jesus. You need the perfect obedience of Jesus when you stand before God in judgment. Because if you stand before God in judgment, you are not his son. Because he has not had complete authority over your life. You have not obeyed him. But Jesus did. You need Jesus' perfect obedience. And so how do, you, how do you gain Jesus' perfect obedience? So that when you stand before God in judgment, you don't stand in your own disobedience, but you have Jesus' perfect obedience. It's called faith. You trust in faith. You trust in Jesus' obedience. This is how it's credited to you. And, and this is why God looks at Jesus when Jesus was being baptized back when he lived on earth and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
the second reason Jesus is God's only true son is because according to God's perfect design, a child should be in the image of their parents. I don't necessarily mean their exact physical image, but just imagine this illustration. It's super rated R, so hide your kids, hide your wives, but imagine, imagine you get a spouse. That's not the rated R part. Um, the story keeps going. But imagine, somehow, by the grace of God, you get a spouse. <laughs> I'm just roasting everyone. I'm joking. But imagine you, ha- you get a spouse, and you guys um, are gonna, about to have a baby, and so you guys go into the emer- operating room, emergency room. I mean, wh- where do people have babies? I, <laughs> you call an ambulance? <laughs> like, I, I'm sorry. I didn't think about this. But you go to wherever the people have the babies. Maybe it's a home birth. Um, anyway, all of a sudden, I'm telling you guys, you need to be ready for this. This is, this is, this is rated R. And the woman begins to give birth. And all of a sudden, a small puppy comes out. So disgusting. Like, think about that. Oh, my gosh. Like, I'm a social puker. (laughs) If someone starts to puke, I usually puke also. Last year, when Chris started puking, because someone, I don't know, someone was hitting him in the kidneys, like, over and over. Grandview Hangouts, they're just different, guys. So just, it wasn't personal. And uh, someone was just, like, destroying him, like, hitting him right in the kidneys. And he's, like coughing and I think bleeding and then all of a sudden he started puking and then I'm, I just I was queasy and so I just lost it too and I, I started puking um, but that's how I think that's what everyone in the doctor's office or the e-room or wh- wherever people have babies that is what everyone would do they would just immediately start vomiting some might even just pass away I would die I think I would just die if I saw a puppy come out I'd be like what? And just die, especially if it was supposed to be my beautiful child and it's just a puppy. It would, it would be absolutely horrifying, traumatizing, and you would never be the same. You're so, and, and why? It's because it's because he's not in your image. And when God looks at your life you do not match his image. You are not cut from the same stone. You are not his kind. He is divine and we are evil. You do not reflect his image. When God looks down on humanity, each and every one of you are a rated R movie. But, but Jesus is in God's perfect image. Jesus is acceptable. Jesus is pleasing to his Father. And you are not. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Long ago, God spoke to the ancestors, the prophets, at different times and in different ways. These days, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir over all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So this is what it means that Jesus is the son of God. He perfectly reveals God's character. He perfectly reflects God's image. He is the son of God. He is the king that was promised by God to the nation of Israel to save them, that would come in the line of David. And we know these things to be true. This is the truth. This is the ultimate truth and the only truth. There is a God, and he sent us his son to die for your sins in your place. And you and me and we all need Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so why is it important 
I gave it away. But why is it important that we proclaim this message? Why is it important that Saul proclaims this message? He knows these truths. He receives these truths. He believes these truths. He lives them out and he proclaims them. Well, if Jesus is the one and only true son, then Jesus is the only one who belongs in his family. He's the only one who belongs in the presence of God for eternity. Jesus' sonship to God is what makes him even capable to live in the presence of a holy God. Just take a moment. Just, we're going to take a moment. I want you to consider the glory and the power and the majesty and the greatness and the purity and the radiant perfection of God. Think, think about the reality. You guys know this is my favorite thing. Just think about we're on a tiny little dust particle flying through space in a solar system. And if you think about it, as far as your eye can see, which is a lot of stars, if you could like group all of that together and you think about one tiny little drop in the ocean, who here has seen the ocean? Okay, I, the first time I saw the ocean, I was absolutely blown away with how big it was. I, I, had, I, I went on a cruise, and I was like, this, I can't see anything in any direction. This, this is insane. If you think about one little drop in the entire ocean in all its depths, that tiny little drop in the ocean is astronomically bigger than our entire universe. Or, no, I'm sorry, our entire galaxy in this universe. We, we are just stuffed away in this corner of the, this vast, unfathomably large universe. And God created it by the word of his power. By one word, exist. And this is the God you think you can get into the presence of and you belong in the presence of? No. His glory and power and majesty demand your allegiance, demand your submission, your humility, and not your rejection. This is why Saul must proclaim this message. It's so that others would be saved from that wrath, from that God. Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners be damned, at least they be damned. At least they leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell will be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go unwarned or unprayed for. And I have a principle for you. If you're saved, you've been sent. If you, all of you, if you are saved, if you're actually saved, then you done been sent. I switched up the principle, but you've been sent. It's like that, it's like that meme or that video or whatever, the guy's like, send it. You know, it's like, it's like that's what God wants that's what he says to your life. Like, you've been saved? Send them. You think that's funny? <laughs> okay. So why don't we? Why don't we proclaim the gospel like we should? Well, we don't proclaim the gospel like we should because we use our circumstances in life as excuses. We don't proclaim the gospel because we pretend that invalid reasons are valid. We make excuses. We say things like, we just don't have time. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a coward. I'm not. I just, I want to get it right. Or, we aren't lazy. We are just overly productive with a really tight schedule. We aren't ashamed of Jesus. We're just trying to be really strategic and wise yeah, we're playing the long game. Well, we don't know how long they have. And just, just to be clear, 
Um, most of those reasons I gave are extremely valid realities. And um, they're responsibilities that God wants us to fulfill. And we are called to, most of us are students, and we want, we want to glorify God um, as a student, or we have jobs, and we want to glorify God or as in a sport, um, or whatever it may be that um, responsibilities that we have right now. And God expects us to glorify him in those. So I'm not saying that those things are the devil or they're evil or something like that. Um, they are valid realities, but what I'm saying is that they are not valid excuses. They're just not valid excuses. So we don't, we don't want to be people who make excuses, do we? We want to be like Saul, who has opportunity to make excuses because of his circumstance, but he doesn't. And look at his circumstance. It's filled with suffering. It's filled with suffering. Think about last week's section of scripture where Eric talked about um, God essentially throwing a cosmic flashbang at uh, Saul when he's on his way to Damascus, just like throws a cosmic flashbang. And he's like, what the heck is going on? Saul falls on the ground and he hears a super scary thundering voice coming from something that he can't even see. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul likely peed himself at this point. And in some distraught position, we have to imagine, looks something like this. God says, or Saul says, who are you, Lord? And Saul said, he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> And he said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And if he hadn't peed, he certainly has now. Then Jesus says, but get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Why does Jesus make it so mysterious? He doesn't tell him what he's about to put him to. He's like, go to the city, then I'll tell you. <laughs> it's like so mysterious. Who knows what Jesus has in store for Saul? Saul has no idea. Imagine, put, put yourself in Saul's shoes. Saul, you're the guy who just recently led the charge and consented to stoning Jesus Christ's friend, Stephen, who is the first ever recorded Christian martyr. And Jesus is like, I got you going to the city. It's like... It, his circumstance isn't great. Now, I, I believe that uh, he understood that Jesus loved him uh, at that time, but I still think that it was probably really crazy circumstance and really confusing. He probably made that face. So, the Lord then left Saul there, blinded and traumatized, and led by the hand into a town where he was unable to eat or drink for three days. And then I can't imagine, or, or I... I imagine that while he was just lying there, he started, probably, he started to probably realize that his whole life had just completely changed. Saul was away from his hometown in Tarsus. He was away from his new hometown in Jerusalem where he had launched an extremely successful career underneath one of the greatest teachers in all of Jewish history, Gamaliel. He lost his job immediately. He had an involuntary career change. He lost all of his friends. He lost all of his influence. He is now a member of an extreme minority. He will almost certainly be disowned. He will be hunted. He has random people as his new best friends. And he is being judged by almost everyone around him as he shares the gospel of salvation with them. The message that can save them, he's trying to share and everyone's just judging him and they say, verse 21, all who heard him were astounded, said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on his name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priest? These people are saying these things about Saul to provoke him. They want him to feel like he's a total freak. He's a weirdo. They want him to feel extremely ashamed for who he is and what he believes. They want him to feel like an outcast. 
They want to discredit him. They want to dismiss him. They want to influence others to not take him serious. It's pure evil. They're stripping Saul of his dignity and respect. This is Saul's circumstance. Another question. Has Jesus completely changed your life? Have you lost anything for Christ? Have your people changed? Has what you say changed? If you do follow Christ, if you, if you actually choose to repent and believe in Jesus and follow him, then you'll follow in his suffering. You'll follow in Saul's, you'll imitate Saul. So what do you do when you follow Christ and it causes you to lose your life? When you lose your comfort, you lose your friends, you lose your family, your reputation, your potential for influence or success, you lose your acceptance to uh, the greater culture at our campuses. When you lose popularity and you know that people are speaking evil against you, Well, look at what Saul did. Saul did not shrink back. He didn't grow weak. He wasn't silenced. Verse 22 says, But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So we don't cower before our campus. You confound them. You confound them. You reason with them. You speak with them. You ask questions. Just go for it. Trust in the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and you just go for it. The Holy Spirit is who saves people, not you. You could walk up to someone and be like, and Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, could save them. He like used a rock or a donkey before, like, just like he, he wants you to intelligibly communicate the gospel. Yes. That's one of the main points of this whole message. But I'm just saying, the Holy Spirit is who saves people. So just go for it. Your Father in heaven just wants you as his child to just join him in what he's doing. So, speaking to the other students on your campus is not for people in ministry. It's not for your campus group leaders. It's not for the older students. It's not for the people who have a church background. It's for you. It's for Christians. So when you're saved, you're sent. The second thing you do when you're suffering in the, for the name of Christ is you rejoice. You Rejoice that you suffer because Matthew 5, Jesus says, You're blessed when you in I'm sorry, you're you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they per- persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we re- we rejoice. And keep this in mind too. God allows suffering in our lives because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. If you look closely at Christian suffering, what you suffer on campus for, for, you, for you, if you look closely at what you suffer, you can, you can see the love of God the wisdom of God, the patience of God, if you look close. Why does God allow opposition? Why does God allow us to suffer in opposition? It's because he's realized something that we often miss, and it's this. The greatest suffering that we could go through as we take the name of Jesus to our campus, 
the greatest suffering, or in our life, the greatest suffering we could go through as Christians is light and momentary. But if we don't spread the gospel to others, their suffering will be so much worse. Yes, your momentary suffering of reputation or whatever suffering we're, you, know, you, you go through um, is not ideal. But how much worse is the suffering that will fall on those who don't repent and trust in Jesus? How much worse will that be? Saul's circumstance did not prevent him from his commission. When you're converted, you're commissioned. When you're saved, you're sent. So go. How do we apply this text? Paul says in Romans 15, 20, My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. So we make it our aim to preach the gospel. Is that your aim? What is your aim in life? I want to be rich. No. I aim at preaching the gospel. Lewis Carroll once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And we don't want to be walking aimlessly wasting our lives so we should aim at preaching the gospel more and more. Second, a part of what made Saul skilled at proving Jesus as the son of God was that he understood scripture. So what should we do? Each of us should devote ourselves to studying the scripture for ourselves. Do you have a Bible? Do you read your Bible? Third, If the message we proclaim is that Jesus is God's promised king and savior, we should obey him like you would obey a king. Most of us did not grow up under a monarchy, so we don't quite understand what sort of authority they hold. But essentially, you do what they say or you die. So, if Jesus is king, what should we do? We obey him like our life depends on it. We, we should share the gospel. We should obey that command. But this goes for all of Jesus' commands. We should treat all of Jesus' commands like he has the authority of a king. Example, when, when you feel, just one example for you Christians. When you feel like getting really impatient, getting angry, getting jealous, getting envious, being unkind, not loving, not rejoicing, to treat Jesus like he's king is to not quench his Holy Spirit. You really want to feel that way. You really want to feel that way. What you need to do if Jesus is king is say to the Holy Spirit, when your your Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is, is, is leading you otherwise, <laughs> leading you to be humble, leading you to say no, what you should say is, yes, your majesty. So when you want to sin and you know the Holy Spirit saying, don't, you get in the habit of saying, yes, your majesty. That's what it means that Jesus is king If Jesus is the one and only true son, yet he has shared his sinless, perfect character with us, the character of God that perfectly reflects the image of our God, the perfect image of God, the only image that God allows to be reflected in his kingdom. The image of God that we don't have by birth and by choice but Jesus does, and he has shared it with us. Jesus gives us credit for it. He allows his perfection to count for us. So 
So we should be shocked. That's what we do. That's how we apply this text. We should be absolutely shocked that Jesus is such a good brother and a friend. He, he is glad to share what only he earned. He only he earned a right to be the child of God. Yet he credits it to you. We should be absolutely shocked that he's not jealous or evil or selfish. That he gladly shares it with you. What a good older brother. If Jesus has the right to be in heaven, if Jesus has the right to be in heaven, and he has given that to us, he's given us the right to be in heaven, then we should rest. We, we should rest because we no longer have to live up to the perfect righteousness of God to be saved. Our brother Jesus lived up to the perfect righteousness of God. And he, if he gave it to us as a gift, then we are set free. We can fully rest and live in the peace of God. So, what should we do? We rest. He earned it for me. He gave it to me. I'm saved. It's over. We rest. Six, we should rejoice that we can know how God acts and thinks. If Jesus is, in fact, the exact expression of God's nature because he himself is God. We can look at our Bible and know our God. We should rejoice. We can know how God acts and thinks and who he is. If you look at him and read what he says, how he acts, and what he thinks, through your Bible. Number seven, we should agree with God. We should agree that God's desire is for you to throw away your entire life. Throw your life away. Throw your purpose away. Throw your dreams away. Throw your aspirations away. We should agree that there is no other purpose more important than this one. Acts, excuse me, Acts 20, 24, 22 through 24. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I'll encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course in the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. We are saved and sent, and we, are, we have been saved to testify to the gospel of grace. Number eight and final point of application. Remember the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you ha uh, may have heard this illustration from the leadership class, but I want you to think about the railroad industry. At one point in U.S. history, the railroad industry was booming, and anyone who joined any aspect of its expansion, whether it was laying the tracks, bringing the tracks, working, like whatever it was, you had great job security and you became pretty wealthy. All of a sudden, the railroad industry started to plummet and then building highways began to take off. Why did each of these flourishing, what did each of these flourishing industries have in common? It, it's that both were backed by the U.S. government. Both were subsidized by the U.S. government. Basically, there was no way for them to fail because if they didn't have money for expansion, the U.S. government would give them free money for expansion. They were backed by the U.S. government. The U.S. government took the risk financially and they weren't going to fail. And so is the case for God's plan for salvation. Jesus declared to Peter, in Matthew, he said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So Jesus is declaring that he will build his church. He's speaking of Peter's life. He says, through your life, I will build my church. And not even the gates of hell will overpower 
what God is doing. And so if the highest authority of the land backing the railroad industry guaranteed its success, how much more will the backing of the highest authority of the universe guarantee the success of the gospel spreading? He will build his church. And if you look back since Jesus said that over 2,000 years ago to this very day across the big blue sea, he continues to prevail. The Holy Spirit will build his church. He will build his church. The Holy Spirit is on the move in our country, all over the world. The Holy Spirit is on the move on our campuses and in your heart. The question is not, will he succeed? The question is, will you join him? pray. Father, um, we just thank you that you have um, loved us and that, Lord, we are not worthy to know you and that you have given us your son as our king, as the savior. Lord, we thank you that you died for our sins. Lord, that we deserve to pay some penalty for our sin, but that God, you came down and and paid for it yourself to offer us all forgiveness and salvation because you love us so much. We thank you that you've saved us and we thank you that you have given us such a high calling and such a great commission. Lord, we've been sent by you to go to all the nations of the earth to proclaim this message of your salvation, your greatness, and your grace. We thank you that your Holy Spirit will build the church and that we have an opportunity to join it. Lord, I pray for every single soul in this room that you would humble them, persuade them to give up their life, to know you, follow you, and to be used by you in this generation for the spread of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for these students and their campus. I pray that you would bring soft hearts to their campus, opportunities to share the gospel, Give us favor, Lord, with with students and administration. God, help us to be sent. In Jesus' name, amen.